Thank you very much, Dermot. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in Glenties. It's three years since I was here. I was here in 2010. Uh, when we addressed, or one of the themes we addressed was this idea of returning to the ideals and the ambitions of the founders of the state in order to try and rethink the republic. And, of course, as you're well aware, much has happened in the three years since uh, the arrival of the, the Troika, the bailout, the consequences for uh, our sovereignty in that regard, a general election which was referred to by the victors as amounting to a democratic revolution, uh, the election of Michael D. Higgins as president that we've just heard about uh, there a few moments ago, um, the Mahon Report, austerity, significant emigration, more revelations about historic abuses, some apologies, and also, of course, promises of political reform. And what I would argue accompanying uh, those promises, a very destructive ambiguity about delivering on that reform. Now, all of these things I mentioned and many more, particularly in the areas of, of political, and, uh, political culture and politics, uh, all of those themes, in both their recent manifestations and their historic manifestations, raise very big questions for anyone who wishes to understand contemporary Ireland, for anyone who wishes to understand aspects of the political history uh, of modern Ireland. And of course, those themes are also of central relevance to one uh, of the issues that this school is addressing this year, this gulf between rhetoric and reality, the preponderance of great ambiguity when it comes to the nature uh, of Irish republicanism, which the programme tells us we will be celebrating uh, in 2016, the centenary of the Easter Rising. Uh, and I do have concerns about the appropriateness of that word, celebrating. Uh, I'm not sure it's the correct word, because I do wonder what exactly we will be celebrating in 2016. What will we be shouting uh, from the rooftops about in terms of the achievements uh, of this little republic? It does seem to me that there will be much to lament. And in saying that, I don't want to bring a corrosive cynicism to an analysis of the events that led to the independence uh, of the 26 counties in 1922. I'm not dismissing the efforts of a revolutionary generation or those who fought for a war, fought the war of independence. Um, but I would make the point that in terms of delivering on the revolutionary promises, in terms of trying to translate some of the revolutionary rhetoric uh, into practice, there is indeed much to lament. And it seems to me there is not an awful lot to be optimistic about at the moment. And that for me is due to a distressing continuity in the history of governance in this country. And it seems to me that if we're going to address some of those themes that I mentioned earlier on and take the long view, we have to try and get to grips with this idea uh, of a history uh, of misgovernance in many respects. And we do have to be very conscious of the experiences of that since independence. And in particular, the demonstration of an ambiguity if not a downright cynical hostility towards the idea of doing things fundamentally different. And in that sense, I do want to build on some of the themes that I would have addressed three years ago here uh, in, in 2010. This question of the failure of the Republic to be realized or to happen was something that was addressed by Michael D. Higgins on his last day uh, in the Doyle as a Labour Party TD in January 2011. And he made the point that he had first stood for election to public office in 1969. And that he was very conscious at that point in 1969 of the failures of the Irish Republic. And he said that 42 years on, in 2011, he still felt that no real republic had been built in Ireland. And they are his words. The failure to make political power republican, he suggested, was due to a reluctance, if not a downright refusal, to distribute power in Ireland. He also referred to the foundations of the state and the determination that came to continue the hegemonic power of the Department of Finance and the idea that there was not any appetite there for challenging uh, the monopoly of power that was enjoyed by Parliament and government. Now, President Higgins, as he is now, has made various other interventions uh, with regard to the Republic and some of the difficulties associated with it. One of his central themes so far in his presidency has been this idea that it is unacceptable that we see economics, politics, and society as belonging to separate, separate spheres. 
He argues that this is not what citizenship is about or should be about. And I think for historians and others who are interested in the condition of contemporary Ireland and are interested in modern Irish history, uh, the reasons that he has put forward need serious consideration. We need to look at the long-term impact of the kind of compartmentalization uh, that he was talking about, that mental uh, compartmentalization in relation uh, to those particular areas. But what also disturbs me today is that there is still such a hostility uh, to the idea of linking those various areas. There's still such uh, hostility and a negativity around the idea, uh, around the notion uh, of engagement with ideas and consultation. And for all the talk of a democratic revolution in 2011, there doesn't seem to be, to be much sign of the idea of that taking on any real meaning. The Constitutional Convention, for example, uh, which has been convened, doesn't address it in a meaningful way. There hasn't been any consultation with the public about the topics that have been addressed by the Constitutional Convention. One third of the seats are reserved for politicians which does not seem to be about the essence of a deliberative democracy. Centralization and unaccountable elites still dominate, if anything more now than they did in the past. And that to me is something that we need to give some attention to. Even the cabinet now plays second uh, fiddle to the Economic Management Council. And I'm glad to see that that's coming into a, a sharper focus, particularly today. Four people within the cabinet who are making all of the key decisions about uh, economic policy, and by extension, arguably, about social policy. The decision not to countenance a reformed Shannon, but instead opt for its abolition, or else its retention uh, as an unreformed, uh, unreformed assembly would also seem to me to involve something of a grubby power grab, that if successful would inevitably copper fasten even further the power of a tiny elite, leaving us in an even worse position than we are in now. Those who have power in Ireland at the moment do not want a reformed Shannon, and we need to wonder why that is the case. They don't want a reformed Shannon with enhanced powers of oversight and scrutiny. And I do think that they, abolitionists, should be asked a simple question about whether they have learned anything about the consequences of the excessive centralization of power in Irish political culture and the abuse of that power uh, over many decades. Most would agree, for example, that the decision to create the Shannon under the Free State Constitution of 1922 was a very enlightened gesture. The idea that it would provide a forum for minority voices, for Protestant uh, voices, those who had fears that their uh, rights to be heard will be drowned out in an overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly Catholic state. It did bring to prominence independent and distinctive voices. You could argue that it still does today uh, in a more limited way. It did also, of course, occasionally challenge legislation that was coming uh, from the Dáil, which is exactly why de Valera decided to abolish it in 1937. He didn't have to put that decision to a referendum under the terms of the 1922 Constitution. He was not required to. Uh, if you were going to make uh, a sig significant move like that, you did not have to hold a referendum. But it did lead to fears, of course, about lack uh, of constitutional safeguards. And these are some of the themes that have been addressed by Dermot Keogh uh, and others in looking at the origins and the background uh, to the Constitution of 1937. And in relation to that Constitution, uh, de Valera did, of course, decide to have uh, a, a, a Shannon, a provision for uh, a Shannon in his new Constitution. But it's interesting the kind of rhetoric that he used about his hopes for this new body, the new Shannon. At the Fianna Fáil Ardesh in 1936, for example, he said that he hoped to see developed gradually here in this country a functional organisation of society by voluntary action. And when that day came, he predicted, the Shannon the could then uh, develop into an assembly that was representative uh, of that kind of voluntary organisation. Now you might ask yourself, was that a typical uh, example uh, of ambiguous speak on the part of de Valera? In reality, he didn't really mean a word of it. In reality, he ignored, as Dermot and others have pointed out, uh, various recommendations that had been made uh, by a group he established to look at a number of different possibilities for a Shannon. He ignored the idea of a Shannon that would have teeth, that would begin to be uh, a body that would try and safeguard uh, human rights in a meaningful way. 
Instead, he ensured, of course, that in practice it would have no real power. The Shannon of 60, 11 of those senators, of course, handpicked uh, by the Taoiseach. Uh, a blatant manipulation of the idea that 43 of the uh, senators would be elected from vocational, vocational categories. As we know, instead, the Shannon became a body that was used to bolster the power of the government or to compensate those who had lost their dull seats. And I would quote in that regard, in relation to the 1970s, the Minister for Defence in 1974, Patrick Donegan, who had to suffer the humiliation of going into the Shannon between 1957 and 1961 after he had lost his Dáil seat. And he said in the Dáil in 1974, in relation to debate about political reform, 1974, I must admit during that period, he said, the late 1950s when he was in the Shannon, I did regard the Shannon and I'm sure the hollowed walls would not fall in, if I say this, as a place or a state of punishment where I must suffer before I return to the Dáil. Now, going back to the 1930s, de Valera's dislike of second chambers was not necessarily shared by all of his contemporaries. Sean McEntee, for example, uh, an influential minister uh, in the 1930s, but not influential enough in relation to the Shannon, did appeal to de Valera not to allow the Shannon to become a complete creature, in McEntee's words, of the government. But that, of course, as we know, was to no avail. Now, when we begin to think about where we are now, the idea of a revised role for the Shannon, a reformed Shannon, proponents of reform are suggesting that you could have a Shannon that would have the power uh, to convene uh, public hearings on matters of national importance, that they would have increased powers uh, of scrutiny, that it would have a genuine gender balance in relation to who was there, the idea that the vocational aspect would actually uh, be respected, and the idea that the electorate for the Shannon could be completely uh, expanded does seem to hold out the possibility that you could begin to think about a Shannon that would be much more representative, that would be much more uh, independent. One of the chief causes of our present crisis, you could argue, uh, was the absence of that kind uh, of scrutiny, the absence of that kind of independence. But what we're getting instead is a suggestion that I think will ultimately result in the handing over of power to a dysfunctional Doyle that, in any case, is effectively a servant of the cabinet that in any case is a servant, as we've seen, of this powerful uh, economic council within the cabinet. That does not seem to me to be about reform. The idea of further centralizing power, you could argue, uh, is a very retrograde step. It does seem to me to beggar belief, uh, given everything uh, that we have been through, and given all of the talk, again, uh, about the need for political reform, the idea that we might have a Shannon, for example, and I'm not suggesting that all the solutions to our ills lie in a reformed Shannon, but the idea that you could at least have an assembly that was in some way representative of the public, that in a sense was about uh, a possibility of having a state that gave a nod to its business being conducted uh, in the interests of the people, as opposed to a state that is a very arrogantly divorced entity from the people that it is supposed to be serving. And I think many people feel like that uh, about the state. So when you think about the alternatives uh, to reform, that for me is what you are really dealing with. And we have to wonder, what are the origins of that hostility to reform, to ideas? Why did Irish political culture become so much about power rather than vision? Again, taking the historian's long-term perspective. You go right back to 1903, Arthur Griffith, who was to become so influential with his Sinn Féin movement, referred in one of his publications to the dangers of a cocky disparagement of modern thinking, which he said was characteristic of the shoddy side of Irish nationalism. Ireland's clever young men, he suggested, praise an imaginary medieval Ireland and then wonder why modern Ireland is decaying around them. This is in 1903. Ireland's clever young man, he went on, while knowing better in private, announced publicly that Ireland and its innocence is more sacred than the wisdom of an infidel world. Ironically, an infidel world that so many Irish people were going to emigrate to in subsequent decades. Now, when you consider those clever young men of that generation, too many of them, of course, sought to restrict free thought. 
But the ambiguities in many respects of those clever young men have been forgiven by many historians and political scientists. In 1997, for example, at the 75th anniversary uh, of the creation of this state, Tom Garvin, a very prolific political scientist, penned a very robust defense of the performance of those who refer to uh, as the Irish revolutionaries turned politicians. He referred to their achievements in ensuring legitimacy towards the state uh, from the 1920s onwards, the survival of democratic institutions at a time when so much was under threat in the 1930s and the 1940s. Despite their mistakes, he suggested, they got it more right than wrong. And it did in many respects seem a convincing argument at the time. It did underline the achievements of that civil war generation in overcoming some of those civil war divisions in order to create a degree of consensus and stability about Irish democracy. But I wonder now, do we need to revisit those conclusions as we approach the centenary? When you think about the cumulative effect, for example, uh, of the revelations of the various tribunal reports, most recently the Mahan report, of the crisis that we are living through at the moment, does that require some kind of qualification or revision uh, of, of that robust defence? Do we need to look back at the extent to which some critics, including John Kelleher, an influential Irish-American writing in the Foreign Affairs magazine in 1957, some of the critiques that they penned about the hostility to intellectual and psychological freedom in Ireland, which by the 1950s, in his view, had done such damage. He wrote that every democratic politician had the right to be pushed, but the sad truth in Ireland was that since the war, there had been no push at all. Instead of vocal discontent, he wrote, we have silence and emigration. And what emigration leaves behind, he continued, was apathy below and smugness above. How true are those words still today, you might wonder. And what about those running the show at that time, according to Kelleher? Power had been achieved, he suggested, by a round-robin process of politicians, clergy, professional gales, pietists, and comfortable bourgeoisie who are looking into each other's hearts and finding there, or pretending to find there, the same tepid desires. Crucially, he also suggested that one of the key problems of the Republic was the paternalism of its governors, meaning the general public is never asked to register an opinion. Again, they were his words in 1957. Now, taking the long view, perhaps the very impulses that created a, a degree of stability, that created that culture of centralization in the earlier decades, facilitated a neglect of civic morality, of discussion about citizenship, prevented the embracing of ideas and of challenges. And of course, the emigration of so many did not help. That neglect ultimately contributed to the kind of systemic and endemic corruption that was identified recently uh, in the Mahan report. And what the Moriarty report had earlier referred to as the devaluing of the quality of Irish democracy itself. There simply was not enough debate about policy, about ideology, about ideas, or about the consequences of relentless and ruthless centralization. And even Tom Garvin acknowledged this in 1997 when he referred to that generation of 1922 as being, whatever about their devotion to national politics, unenthusiastic Democrats who were qualified in their attachment to democratic ideals and not prepared to trust people with the power to run their own affairs. And again, you can see how centrally relevant all of these themes uh, remain. In practice, politics became about the spoils of the system. In practice, politics became about management rather than vision. As Brendan O'Hare uh, was to satirise it in his Begrudger's Guide to Irish Politics, it was essentially about how the bottom rung of the ladder to power is hammered firmly into place. And once that ladder has been climbed, about keeping and holding on to power at all costs. Kelleher also identified, interestingly, in 1957, the problem of the absence of local autonomy and local government, which meant in his view that the Gaul, as a result, was the only forum in the country where there was any semblance of real power. And when the democratic process was reneged on there, you had reached the end of the line. But you could argue that even that was being overly generous, 
After all, nearly 20 years later, in 1975, in the midst of more debate about political reform and the Oireachtas, Barry Desmond was to point out that successive cabinets had regarded the Doyle and the Shannon, in his own words, as wearisome intrusions into the routine of implementing cabinet and civil service decisions. Political culture, too, was male-dominated. It was closed in many respects. And those with ideas about doing things very differently were often dismissed as mavericks, maverick intellectuals who had no place in Irish politics. As Bertie Ahern was to record, Bertie Ahern of that glorious class of Fianna Fáil TDs elected in 1977, including Porrick Flynn in a white suit. Ahern was to argue in 1977 that intellectuals, if they got power, would ruin the country. I kept my appeal very simple, he wrote in his autobiography. I would turn up at supermarkets. I would flirt with the housewives. I would joke with the husbands about football. And he went on that for him the oldest rule in politics is that while the other lot are the opposition, you will find all your actual enemies on your own side. From the moment I was elected in 1977, he continued, the only plotting I was doing was about how to hold on to my seat. On such sophisticated foundations was built the career of electorally the most successful Prime Minister in modern Irish history after Eamon de Valera. Now when you think about the consequences of that mindset, and I'm not just singling out Bertie Ahern in that regard, it's just because he has written about it uh, in recent times. You also have to acknowledge other aspects and I don't need to labour the point here about the abrogation of responsibility that resulted in the Catholic Church having far too much power. It's a point that was made by Emily O'Reilly last night. It did result in a very narrow focus on what constituted immorality, on what constituted national welfare, what Garvin referred to as resulting in the politics of cultural defence, uh, which we're still seeing some uh, of that being played out today uh, in relation to the abortion question. But to finish... I would make the point that the network of alliances, the vested interests that were built up uh, and facilitated arguably corruption and stymied debate are not recent creations. They thrived originally in a very small protected economy and society that was socially uh, very snobbish, that was very hierarchical. And that's a reminder that we shouldn't just be focusing on politicians. There were venal people who were prepared to buy politicians, who were prepared to re-elect those who were plainly incompetent or untruthful, those who were rewarded well beyond their capacities. There were those who were prepared to continue to champion uh, excessive localism to their own advantage in terms of access to their politicians. Likewise, when it comes to those, unfortunately, who were locked up as a result of the crime of being too poor or being deemed uh, to be somehow morally suspect, and we've had so many revelations uh, in that regard uh, in recent years. That was not just about state or church. The reliance, the excessive reliance on institutionalization was due to a wide range of reasons. You can see that in relation to the Magdalen Laundries, for example. There were a host of power alliances and socio-moral attitudes uh, that led to that excessive reliance. If they had one thing in common, those particular individuals who were incarcerated, it was that they were poor. And therein lies another one of the great ambiguities of the Republic. Because side by side with that institutionalization, we had the continuance of the myth and the articulation of the idea that we don't do class divisions in Ireland. That class was not a relevant theme in Irish society. And that's why I think so many of those whose very existence challenged the hollowness of the rhetoric of Irish republicanism were hidden from view. Now finally, it's important to say that occasionally the generation of 1922 did revisit some of the history that they had created, some of the history that they had lived through, some of the history that they had made. Fifty years ago in 1963, Sean Lamas, for example, referred to the democratic program of the first thought. In the newly elected Sinn Féin TDs unveiled their program their social vision, the idea of greater humanity, greater enlightenment, greater fairness under native rule. 
What Lamas suggested in 1963 was this, this was not a program in a real sense, but the avowal of an intention to make national freedom when won, the beginning of a campaign to undo or to undo the social and economic consequences of national subjection. Now what strikes me in that particular contribution is that phrase, the avowal of an attention, intention. It seems to me that we've had plenty of avowals of intentions uh, in modern Irish history, but precious little attempt to move beyond them. And we don't complain enough about this, and we haven't done enough about this, particularly if we accept a definition of republicanism that is about participation, that is about a say in our fate, that is about civic engagement, that is about actually realizing uh, freedom and self-determination. If we do accept that definition of republicanism, well then we face the conclusion that any exaggerated celebration in 2016 is simply going to mask the persistence of an ambiguity and the endurance of a dangerous gulf between rhetoric and reality. Thanks for your patience.